distinguished members and guests of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. It's an honor to present the gold medal for Belle Lettres and Criticism to Helen Hennessy Wendler, one of those rare spirits who has elevated criticism to the special dignity of art, to Belle Lettres. On great poets of the past, she awakens delighted assent, and on contemporary poets, astonishment at her swift grasp of what a poet's doing as an artist. To all for whom poetry is a necessity of life, Helen Wendler has been a beacon of good sense carried forward at the level of genius. In her 2001 Haskins lecture for the ACLS, Helen Wendler quotes Joseph Conrad on that mysterious, almost miraculous power of producing striking effects by means impossible of detection, which is the last word of the highest art. Finding that source of aesthetic truth in the last word of the highest art has always been Helen Wendler's proud calling, as in her landmark study of George Herbert, which prefers this subtle artist of our inner states to the hectic and theatrical John Donne. She also reveals high intellectual adventure where appearances are of deceiving simplicity, as when, in her stupendous explication of Shakespeare's 154 sonnets, time's best jewel is not the beloved's natural beauty, but rather its carbonized allomorph. Helen Wendler has written brilliantly on John Milton, authoritatively on Emily Dickinson, sensitively on John Keats, magisterially on William Butler Yeats, fundamentally on Wallace Stevens, and indispensably on Seamus Heaney and on Jory Graham. The most challenging English language poets of the past century have been Americans, many of them inheritors of Wallace Stevens, whose long poems Helen Bendler pioneered in On Extended Wings. She's performed miracles of exposition with the works of, among many, many others, this is a very short list, Walt Whitman, Langston Hughes, Allen Ginsberg, John Berryman, John Ashbery, Robert Lowell, Elizabeth Bishop, Sylvia Plath, Lucille Clifton, James Merrill, A.R. Ammons, James Wright, Frank Bedard, Louise Glick, Rita Dove, and Lucy Brock Broido, many of them members of this academy. Helen Wendler once quoted Cheslow Miwash to the effect that every achieved poem is a symbol of freedom. This is rarely true of criticism, but it's always true of hers. And now to the Academy's official citation, which reads, over the course of her brilliant career, Helen Hennessy Wendler has demonstrated with conviction and sense how best to read poetry as a high and unique art. Her remarkable lucidity in examining the difficult, often elusive ways by which poems achieve meaning, especially how syntax shapes poetic argument, in such diverse poets as Shakespeare, John Keats, Emily Dickinson, and Wallace Stevens, is unparalleled. As our foremost critic of poetry, she has helped create discerning enthusiasm for the work of some of our greatest contemporary poets. Members of the Academy, I am honored to accept this gold medal on behalf of my friend Helen Hennessy Wendler, who has written these brief words of acceptance. So now I'm going to read Helen Wendler's words of acceptance. To today's audience, I truly wish I could be with you, but my health to my regret doesn't permit it. To the Academy, my heartfelt thanks for this great honor. To my friend and Harvard colleague, Gordon Teske, 
who has taught me so much about long form poetry, I thank you not for not only agreeing to present the gold medal, but also for voicing my thanks, testifying to the wonder of lyric poetry and explaining my efforts to better understand its motives and structures. I thought I might briefly talk of what brought me to lyric poetry. My teacher mother had been banished from the classroom by state rules demanding the dismissal of women after their marriage. Unhappy at home, she recited aloud to us canonical poems from her anthologies, while my bilingual teacher father compelled my sister and me to learn after school Spanish, French, and Italian. In my Catholic schools, we were studying Latin and singing year-long the Latin liturgy and Latin hymns. My parents' insistence on a Catholic college led, me to, my, led to my leaving the ideology-driven English major in favor of uncorrupt chemistry, which introduced me the, to the pervasive molecular and structural patterning in nature, giving me a lifelong interest in original structures. Uh, when I wrote from Belgium to inquire about the PhD program at Harvard, I was told by return mail that I was not a suitable candidate. I therefore spent a year with informal graduate student status at the hospitable English department of Boston University and was then admitted to the Harvard PhD. In both places, I found inspiring and sympathetic teachers which at Harvard were all male, some prejudiced against women, some not. Several of them sponsored me as generously as they sponsored their male students, and I'm still grateful for their liberal kindness. I was too passionately engaged with the forms and rhythms of verse to read novels and non-poetic dramas with any patience. I wrote verse myself from age six to 26, always disappointed in the results till I discovered in writing my dissertation that I could love reporting on my inquiries into poetry, that I was meant to be writing not verse, but prose about verse, that I did not have the creative imagination, but that I loved solving aesthetic problems. When I came to Harvard, the dean, recognizing the indifference to serious poetry in the schools, asked me to construct a poetry course for students not concentrating in the humanities. I wrote my own textbook and happily for many years taught future stockbrokers, doctors, engineers, and scientists, many of whom gained a conscious love of poetry. But given the absence of instruction in their youth, our poets must now educate themselves, as Whitman and Dickinson had to do, suffering the usual isolation of the gifted. All men say what to me? Dickinson wrote in exasperation, and Whitman knew that genteel editors would consider his poetry a barbaric yawp. Even so, both poets left us works of genius, in many ways traditional, but also entirely original in their subversions of tradition. Our students deserve to know not only that poetry arises in every language and culture, but also that our American poetry is a precious legacy of learning and creation, worthy of patriotic perpetuation, not only by poets, but by critics as well. So I hold this up without opening it, lest it fall out. To Helen Wendler.